podcast where we focus on helping you claim what's rightfully yours, your health, and your freedom. We explore the three main areas of health, the physical realm, the biochemical realm, and the mental and emotional realm. We also explore all the areas of lifestyle we can find that will help you live more abundantly, regardless of where you're starting. And remember, in life, you'll either make excuses or create results. You choose. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Hant, and I'm glad to be with you here today. Make sure to head on down to the show notes and click on the link to join our tribe of human-powered life heroes, where we'll update you on new shows, events, product launches, and so much more. Now, it's time to enjoy the show. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Josh Hant, and I want to welcome you back to the Human Powered Life Podcast. Once again, we have another amazing guest. I think you're going to enjoy this story. Hopefully, you're going to learn a lot. And as you should in all episodes, take some action steps to get and be healthier. So this is Dr. Michael Biamonte. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Josh. Thanks. All right. So what I would love for you to do to start this, this show off is give the audience a little bit of your background you know when i got your bio and i see the words you know nasa it was like one of the first things i saw i go huh and then then we get into health and we get into technology and software and nutrition i'm like okay i want to learn more so give us you know the backstory and lead us up to where we are today well back in the early days the old days when i was in um, naturopathic school i was primarily studying how to interpret lab work in a way that would be much more expansive than the average MD does. The average MD looks at a blood test, there's certain parameters, there's a reference range, high and low. And if you're within those ranges, he says you're healthy, you have no disease. Well, that's not the way nutritionists look at it. We have a reference range that we operate um, using within the range, let's say. So like, let's just say for an example, alkaline phosphatase, which is one of a blood marker you see in most blood tests. Alkaline phosphatase is a zinc activated enzyme, and it's used primarily by doctors to to understand whether or not someone has a broken bone, because if it's elevated, it could indicate you broke a bone, or if it's elevated, it could indicate cancer, right? Mm -hmm. We use alkaline phosphatase as a marker for the adrenal glands. And when we do that, we have a special reference range that we use, and we do this with all blood chemistries. So we will take, let's say if the range is 40 to 80, We'll add 40 and 80 together. We get 120. We divide it by two. Now we have 60. And now we go plus or minus 10 on either side as a buffer. So that's how we would look at it, looking Mm. at blood work. Even back then, I studied with Ken Brockman and Jim Seema, who were two chiropractors who were like leading the way in interpreting blood work from a much more expansive viewpoint. And by the time I got out of school, I decided I wanted a, a computer to be able to do this because I had collected about 120 algorithms and looking at the blood work. So an algorithm, in case people are unfamiliar with that term, it's sort of like a mathematical computation where you have two or more variables involved. So you have to look at multiple facets all at once in order to come up with the end result of the equation. So I was running around Long Island at that time, which is where I was from, and I was visiting health food stores, passing out my business cards. And this woman who I met in one of the stores told me that I need to speak to this particular doctor because he or he already had a computer and he was already doing what I wanted to do. So I called the fellow up on the phone. The man ended up being the same person who developed the life support systems on the lunar module. <laughs> and he was working at Grumman. He was an aerospace physiologist. He was also a naturopath and a clinical nutritionist. So he invited me to come and look at what they had. I was pretty I was pretty amazed because he had really what he had a son who was a was working on his PhD in computer language. So he had the advantage of the like the technical aspect of what he knew and then his son's technical ability with computer programming. So this went beyond what I was even hoping I could ever come up with. So I joined this team that they had at Grumman. We had about 10 full-time researchers who were all also in private practice as nutritionists. They were, some of them were chiropractors. Some of them were uh, PhDs. Some of them were MDs. So this group of, of ours were putting together data so that we could actually have a working model of the human body that would be in Fortran language. So for those of you who don't know Fortran language, it's, t- it's called table-driven. 
And it's a type of computer program where if you want to change something, you don't have to rewrite the whole program. You just go in and either take a table out or put a table in between some other area to to add or take away from it, which is the perfect thing when you're trying to mock up a simulation of the human body. So we got this computer to up to the point where it would look at a standard blood test, like an SMA-26. It would also look at a urine analysis that could look at chiropractic adjustments. It could look at acupuncture points. And then it also would look at a hair mineral analysis. And from all this data, it would come up with a simulation of the person's body. So it actually run through every week, basically loaded guidance physiology book into this system, along with all the other data that we were coming up with on nutrition. So the computer, when you give it this data, would come up with a whole simulation of the person's body. And for legal concerns, the computer didn't speak in terms of pathology, right? It didn't say your adrenal glands are, are like, you know, falling out of your body, you're in bad shape. Didn't say anything in terms of pathology. It spoke in terms of physiology. So it would say if someone's adrenals weren't functioning correctly, it would spot exactly why. It would say that there's not enough pentathenic acid in the adrenal cortex for this adrenal, for the, your, these adrenal glands to manufacture glucocorticoid hormones or something to that effect. It didn't speak in terms of disease. It was speaking in terms of physiology. And that's so that we, we weren't accused of practicing medicine. Hmm. That's wild. But, but it's also a better vantage point too if you're talking physiology rather than disease it's more i think it's a better vantage point to, from an understanding viewpoint so to make a long story short this computer model was supposed to be used by the astronauts while they were in deep space station uh, missions in order to determine what nutrients they needed to have in order to keep a positive nitrogen balance and to keep their calcium level because when you're in a weightless environment you lose muscle mass and you lose calcium that was the biggest concern that we had with the, with the uh, astronauts in the space station well it turned out that we overran our budget and nasa cut us so NASA went to Grumman and said, forget it. These guys are spending way too much money. And it was true. We were, we were having nutritionists fly in from all over the world and just putting it on our expense account, putting them up in hotels and whatnot. And then they would stay for a week. They would give us all the data they had to add to the model, and then they went home. But that ended up costing like two or $3,000 per person back in those days. So we got cut, and we were sitting around a table after we just found out that we were cut and our eight years of work was finished. And one of the guys said, well, what do we do with this now? What do we do with the model? Because we assumed Grumman was going to want to keep it. And Grumman said, no, Grumman said that you guys did all this work. You guys keep it, keep the model. NASA doesn't want it. So you keep it. So we took the model. We went into private practice, all of us using the, the model. This is back in 1984, 85. So we were getting really good results and we were having doctors send us their lab work so that we can run it through the computer and give them back an analysis on their patients. So the computer would give you like a, a 20 page report on the person's physiology, show you everything that was wrong. It would indicate what supplements they needed and what diet they needed. Hmm. So we're happy going along with this. We were making money with the computer. People were getting well, we were reversing arthritis, all these problems. And then we noticed that there was like 20%, 30% of the people who weren't getting good results. As a matter of fact, their results were mystifying because they would take the vitamins and they'd have opposite, the opposite reaction. They were having all these bad reactions, like they were all intolerant of the vitamins. So I volunteered out of the group to figure out what was going on with these people. So after about six months of looking at their folders and studying their history and studying all their lab work, I determined that they had some kind of dysbiosis. Now, in these days, we were just learning the word dysbiosis and what it meant. We didn't really know anything like we know now. But I contacted Marty Lee and Steve Barry, who were the owners at that time of Great Smokies Lab, who then became Genova Labs. And I told them about this, what, I, what we had going on. And they offered to do stool testing free on these patients to see if we could figure out what was happening. And sure enough, what started to come up in all of them was candida. Now, I didn't really know much about Candida at that point. So to tell you how naive I was, I told these people, I said, well, you have Candida. It's this Candida is this intestinal fungus that you have. It's like a yeast overgrowth. And it causes people to react strangely to vitamins or medications because 
uh, when candida mixes with the nutrients, it, they, it releases toxins and you feel sick. That's why you're not able to handle the vitamins. I said, go to your medical doctor, tell him you have candida and tell him, you know, get have him cure you and then come back and we'll put you back on the program. Hey, we're giving you a short break here where you can head down to the show notes or lifestylelocker.com and join our tribe of human-powered life heroes. You'll be the first to know about new shows, events, product launches, affiliate specials, and more. And now, back to the show. The stories I heard after that point were, oh, the doctor said there's no such thing as candida. The doctor says everybody has candida, all of this. So we didn't get anywhere. So then at that point, I happen to have been good friends with Robert Atkins and Ronald Hoffman, who at that point were the two main functional medical doctors in, in New York City. So I sent all these people to them and they came back and they told me, well, this is much better. They said they they understood what Candida was. They knew about it. And they put me on this drug called Nystatin. And I felt better for the first two months. And then I, I wasn't feeling well again. And then they raised the dose higher, and I felt even worse. So I said, I have to figure this out. So I spent the next few years learning about candida and figuring out the mysteries and the, the riddles of it to the point where I developed my protocol, which is covered in my book, The Candida Chronicles. And why we call it The Candida Chronicles is because it's really chronicling my journey through figuring out candida and figuring out all the um the, the different loose floorboards that you run into when you have candida and all the mystery of it. And um, that's where we are now. That's what brings us up to today. Hmm. And uh, my practice specializes in handling people with candida. And we have a, a very defined protocol that's evolved over the last 30 years. That's very specific. We've added to it and expanded it when we get new data, but essentially it's a, it's a very, um, comprehensive protocol, which handles every aspect of the person having candida. We have basically five different steps in the treatment, and each step addresses the candida at a different stage of growth, uh, leading up to putting the person's probiotics back or getting leaky gut handled, if that's their case. Then we go into the stages more where we use the computer software. And the first thing we're dealing with, once we have the person's probiotics back intact, we're dealing with toxicity because chemical and metal toxicities are things that trigger candida. So we're, we're, we're basically handling that on the person first. Then this is typical. We end up handling their adrenal and thyroid. Now, not because it's necessarily written in stone that we have to. It's because just about every candida patient you run into who's, who has candida chronically will have their adrenal and thyroid totally off mark. Hmm. So let me ask you a question. So, in the journey going, you know, finding out and learning about candida, um, you're you still using your technology with with these patients, you know, from the, you got that you helped develop. And I'm sure has it has that evolved as well? Oh, yeah. Tremendous. OK, yeah. so we're doing that. You have you know, I, I imagine you're doing blood work because we're using that with the technology. What other types of tests are you doing to, to one identify that it is a candida issue? Yeah. Right. Like that would be the first. And then, you know, bring us down like a path of a patient. Like what would be like some symptoms? Like why would like what would they come to you for? Guessing well, they may have that. Typically, the person, because I'm on so many podcasts mm. and because I've personally done over 70 of my own that are on my website, people will hear the podcasts and they'll recognize the symptoms and then they end up coming to me or they're referred by somebody else. OK, that's typically how they find me nowadays. But the the symptoms of candida are very interesting because they're very disrelated. Like candida begins with the person being fatigued and tired, and then it evolves to having cognitive problems, not memory loss. They walk into a room and they say, why am I in this room? They forget people's names. Then they start noticing digestive issues. They get constipated. They have bloating. They have gas. Then they might start having skin problems, eczema, psoriasis, etc. They could develop asthma. They start having food allergies. Then the key thing happens. They start developing a chemical intolerance. They're no longer able to be around somebody who has perfume or cologne on. They can't handle cigarette smoke. They can't handle the smell of cleaning solutions like bleach and other typical cleaners that are used. 
that's where the person usually has now become overwhelmed by the candida. They've usually at that point developed leaky gut syndrome, which is where the candida damages your intestinal tract and makes it porous so that things going through your bloodstream that normally would be prevented from entering your blood. I'm sorry, things going through your intestines mm, that would yeah. normally be prevented from going into your bloodstream are able to leak in. And this basically over, overloads your detox system, your liver, your spleen, your lymphatic system become overloaded. And now the person is what we call a universal reactor at that point. They're just reacting to everything universally. Interesting. interesting. And is there, you know, if someone's experiencing, because I know it's like it's a long road, right? It sounds like that that people may go on and I guess different levels of, I don't know, infestation. <laughs> so yes. That's easier way for me to think about it. Yeah. You know, with, with that going on, is there like either a home test that someone can check, like just to get an idea, okay, I have something going on. Now I know it. Now I need to find a doctor, Michael Biamonte. Or is there something they can do before they jump? There's, yeah, there's a couple of things they can do. There's um a test that's evolved over the last few years that is – um, a little hoogie doogie in a way, but it does give you some kind of result. It's basically you spit into a glass of water and you watch the formation of the spit in water. Mm. And this has been pushed as a test for candida, a home test, because if the, if the spittle in the water develops legs and starts to look really weird and gooey, mm. people are saying that's candida. It's actually not candida. It's, it's dysbiosis someone has when they have that kind of reaction with their saliva and water. Okay, but so, someone could do that, and that would be a hint. You, they could also go online and look for different stool tests, which you can do. Nowadays, there's lot there's lots of internet sites that will sell you a stool test that you can do. That's a, of the DNA variety. This is like the the latest technology with stool tests. Is that instead of doing the traditional culture and microscopic study, they run DNA studies on your stool to look for the DNA of all bacteria of all huh. microorganisms there. You can do one of those and you can find that you have candida in that way. But there's just one thing I want to warn people on. The DNA tests are not 100%. What is 100% is if you do, and this is something we proved back in the days when we were working with Great Smokies Labs. If you do a stool test and you're found to be absent in, in normal flora, it would automatically serve as a diagnosis for candida because it's the normal flora that prevents candida growth. And the normal flora is much easier to find in the stool test than candida is because candida doesn't grow in a uniform matter in your stool. It grows in a very splotchy, blotty mm. kind of formation. But the uh, bacteria in your intestinal tract grow grows just like moss going up a building. It's very uniform in how it's covered. Oh, so if a, if a person was to do that test and they were to find that they were absent of friendly flora, it automatically means you would have candida whether they find candida or not. You could also look on websites for an organic acid test, and you would be called a dysbiosis or micro, microbiology dysbi uh, organic acid test. And they're looking for organic acids from harmful bacteria, parasites, and candida on that test. Mm. So that would also serve as, um, as a, a good marker for whether or not you do have it or not. Yeah. And does, is, it like, is there an age range that this starts to show up or you can see it through the whole range of life? Well, we get we get children at six months coming to us with thrush. Okay, you know we get thrush and vaginal yeast at six months. If their mother has it, they're born with it, mm -hmm. and those kids typically then one of the first things they they start to have as a child is eczema and asthma. That's the typical profile of kid who's born with with candida. They will develop eczema, eczema and asthma if they have the genes leaning in that direction. Interesting. If if they don't, that maybe they'll manifest some other way, but. Mm. That's very typical. Food allergies in kids is very often due to this. And of course, autism. Well, almost all autistic kids have candida because the, the toxicity they have and their inability to detoxify um, the copper and the mercury that they've accumulated from vaccines and from the amalgam fillings, that will predispose them to candida growth. And that goes back to the toxic metals. That's uh, people always say, well, what causes candida? Well, toxic metals do. If if somehow somebody occurs mercury toxicity or copper toxicity, that metal toxicity will cause candida to grow in their body. But the primary way that most people develop candida is through drugs, prescription drugs. Antibiotics are always yeah, the top one. That was one. my question. Yeah. 
I was gonna Up one that. that causes candida is antibiotics because broad spectrum antibiotics don't singularly attack just one bacteria that the doctor wants to kill. The bacteria are um, generally are all destroyed, and that includes your friendly bacteria that prevents candida. And that brings us kind of to what the game with candida is. The basic game of candida, if you want to look at it as a game, is you've got to get the candida low enough back to back to a low level so that the probiotics are able to take over. Everybody is being told who has candida to take probiotics, yet people still have candida after they've taken the probiotics. And that's because the probiotic is unable to unseat the candida. See, once you have candida, it's there and it's going to repel the probiotic. It is true that if you can get rid of the candida and put the probiotic back, that stops the candida from returning. But you have to do it that way. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. And do you see uh, usually I know since we're mentioned like the metals, um, antibiotics, you know, I'm sure there's many other medications that cortisone, that prednisone, estrogen, yeah. Yeah. hormones, antacids. Yeah. So when you when you're when you find someone, let's say they're an adult that's probably had, you know, antibiotics and maybe had the, you know, the fillings have maybe had different vaccines with, you know, mercury, aluminum, all these different metals in it. And they're, let's say, 30, 40 years old. Do they also when you when you find candida, do they usually end up showing up? You mentioned leaky gut. Do they show up with also like different types of parasites? You see, theoretically, candida is a part of dysbiosis. The word okay. dysbiosis means the person has an imbalance between the sum aggregate of all the good organisms in their gut and, and the bad, bad ones. Yeah. Okay. That's technically what dysbiosis means. Yes. So I would say it's almost impossible to find a patient who only has candida. They, to some degree, always have harmful bacteria there, like Klebsiella or Citrobacter or one of those. Mm. And they also will have intestinal worms or protozoa like amoebas and giardias or blastocystis hominis or one of those bugs will also be there that's very common okay okay uh, i'm trying to think because this is this is interesting it, it seems like this is can be like an underlying do you do and well i guess this is one question i'm just thinking of people i know and, and patients in my practice and uh is it also common that people will have a hard time maybe even losing weight yes that's actually one of the um symptoms of candida and it's because of candida's effect on your thyroid mm. what's really interesting is if you look at my way i have three principal websites i have health-truth.com i have the new york city candida doctor and i have another website that's called the new york city thyroid doctor and the reason why i have a website that specializes in thyroid because thyroid is one of the major things that candida affects and it affects it in a unique way not typical to your average thyroid patient so because of that, the person with candida usually doesn't lose weight very well. I'll give you an example. There was a young lady who came to us quite a while ago who had been on Atkins for months and months and months, and she wasn't losing an ounce on Atkins. We tested her, and amongst the things we found, she had candida pretty bad. So we didn't change her diet. We left her doing Atkins, but we just put her on our program to eliminate the candida. And from taking the things that she was doing on my program that were the different supplements to get rid of candida. She started losing weight like a normal person would on Atkins. Yeah, no, that's, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's, I see patients that have tried, you know, the ketogenic diet that have tried paleo that have done different variations of different things. And like, doc, I, you know, I think I'm gaining weight when I'm doing the you know, healthy thing versus eating the crap I was eating before. Actually in Dr. Atkins book, I think even in his, one of his first books, he said in the book that there's two things that will prevent my diet from working in somebody. One is low thyroid. The other is candida. Huh, there you go. That, that's under. back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. So um, you mentioned the websites. You mentioned the book. Um, are you do? Can people find you on social media as well? Oh, yeah. We're on uh, Instagram. Mm -hmm. We're on Facebook. They can find us easily there. Okay. Okay. So what I want to do, I want to pause for a second. I want to jump back into the video portion, but is there, is there anything else you think that we missed that, you know, that, that our audience needs to know just in this audio ver in this audio section? Yeah. I would say if someone is having, if someone has poor health and they particularly have some of the symptoms I mentioned earlier that come about chronologically, this is what I well, this is what I invite them to do. Sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and find a sort of like make a, a long line that's your whole life from the beginning, from when you were born to where you are now. So put you I want them to put together a timeline and I want them to start marking when certain symptoms began. 
and then see if right before those symptoms began, you were on antibiotics for acne or antibiotics for some situation. You were on some kind of steroid or cortisone, prednisone. You started taking um, antacid pills or something that would disturb your intestinal flora. That may they may need to look that up, but I just gave them right now some of the major reasons why. Right there, antibiotics, yeah. steroids, antacids. It could even be a, a, something like they went away for the summer, and they were in a chlorinated pool for a lot of the summer, and that chlorine chlorinated water they ingested would kill their flora. They didn't have to go there and drink it with a cup. I Me mean, just being in the water every day and you just absorbing it through your skin could kill your flora. Hmm. So you, so if you can map out a timeline of where these symptoms developed, and if you can find you're in a car accident, so you're in the hospital, they gave you antibiotics, and now after that, you were tired, you started having memory problems, you started getting bloating and gas, you put together a timeline of this, and this could lead them to, for their own, on their own, deduce they have candida. Then they can go ahead and get tested and hmm. find out if they do or not. That's, that's, I mean, that's such a great thing. It's, you know, it's like telling someone to do a food diary. But now yep, we have like this absolutely. long timeline and that's, that's, I think that's very beneficial. I, I would bet, you know, if you have, if whoever's listening, if you have parents that are, that are still alive, depending on how old you are, they could tell you, oh yeah, when you were born, you were on antibiotics at six months old. Then we had an ear infection. We put you on at two years old. And then, and then, you, you know, we go, holy cow, you've had how many doses of this in your life? And no wonder your digestive tract is, is destroyed. And then there's also where you live, you see, mm. because where you live, you can end up with sick building syndrome. You could, they could have lived in a building or worked in a building that was really contaminated with mold mm. and, or the building might've had old copper plumbing. So from, if, if you, if someone suspects this, you look at your drain and you see if the drain is, is stained green. If your drain is stained green, it means that there's copper leaching out of the water, which is reacting with the drain. If it's stained orange, it means there's iron leaching out of your water, which is there. And your ingestion of copper and iron would also be something that would predispose you or cause candida. Well, there you go. There you go. And yeah, we we had a whole show on on mold toxicity with the, the gotmold.com guy. So our audience Let definitely... Me is paid attention. Let, let me add one thing to that, which is the interesting. I'm sure he would agree because he has experience with this. When you go into a house, a mold house with different people living there, as you interview the people, you're going to find that not everybody is being affected the same way. Mm -hmm. Yep, he did you're, mention you're, that. You're going to find there's one person or two people there who are far more symptomatic than everyone else. And that those people that are far more symptomatic are the ones who have chronic candida. Oh, interesting. Okay. We didn't get there, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? It's, it's a fungal overgrowth, right? That will, right. So that's wild. So, so everybody, this is, this is the genius behind uh, Candida here, right? So we have an expert. So for everybody that, that wants to connect, we'll have all his details in the show notes, his social links, all of the above uh, website, very easy to get to. I mean, you plug his name into into the, the Google machine and you, you'll find him for sure. One of those three websites, I'm sure, will pop up. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Michael Biamonte, and this has been a lot of fun. I learned a whole lot. Uh, I'm actually excited to learn more and dive a little bit deeper into this topic since it's not something that regularly comes up in front of my face. Uh, and I'm glad I've learned this small chunk now, and I know I'm, I'm in functional medicine school right now myself, so I'm sure this will be a section I will probably pay a little bit more attention to mm -hmm. than I may have before, because it seems like it's a very large problem. There are, there are the two greatest, I would say, problems that we have, which go undetected and undiagnosed, are probably toxic metals and something like candida. Mm. Those, are the two pro those are the two illnesses that affect so many people that are causing so many symptoms. And I don't care what the doctor says your illness is. I don't care what fancy name he gives it out of a book. It will eventually boil down in many cases to toxic metals and some type of a dysbiosis. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, the, the cause, right? Not the symptom that, that gets right. the name at not, the end. Not the symptom and the name. And then the, then you watch the different commercial on TV where the drug companies are trying to sell you the drug that has a million side effects mm -hmm. that might kill you before the drug helps you. But 
That those yeah. commercials are just—I think they're hysterical. Yeah. Some of these commercials. Yes, yes. So we can definitely talk about that in a minute. So everybody, Dr. Michael Biamonte, check him out, and we'll see you on the video portion in just a minute. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Human Powered Life Podcast. Make sure to head over to lifestylelocker.com to check out all the details on the show and to watch part two of this episode, which is only in video format. We also have this audio portion in video format if you want. Once again, I'm your host, Dr. Josh Hant for the Human Powered Life Podcast, and I'm looking forward to staying connected with you as a human powered life hero. Remember to join the tribe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.